Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. A friend of mine claims to have been chased by a gnarly pale looking creature while hunting in the woods with some friends of his. One of his group had a medical emergency and fell unconscious. And when my friend took off on his four-wheeler to get help, what he described as a ghostly humanoid figure gave chase. The most unsettling part was that it started gaining on him before he floored it out of there. My friend is convinced that what he saw was an angel of death that was trying to keep him from saving his buddy, who survived after they did CPR on him. What's more, is that he had kept to incident to himself until years later. When he and his buddies were eating dinner one night and out of the blue asked one of his friends whether he had seen anything strange in the woods that night. All those years ago, the guy went pale and said he had thought we was crazy for seeing something, and went on to describe the same thing that my friend saw. Obviously the whole thing is pretty far-fetched, but damn if it wasn't a good story when he told it. Three of us were deer hunting near the glen of a mall. Just as dusk was setting in we see eight people from our hide dressed in full army attire. Thought it was the defense forces at first until they started digging and retrieving items from a bunker of sorts. Turns out the area was a known burial spot for paramilitary weapons. Kept quiet for a good two hours until we could get away safely. Didn't frequent that spot for a few years. A hunter told me this story when I was younger, about 16 years ago. He was raccoon hunting in the mountains around Blair, Wyoming, around 11 p.m., a new moon night, so no natural lighting. As typical for raccoon hunters, he had three hunting dogs, each with a locator collar, for in an event the dogs trailed off and didn't return to the hunter. Also, the use of flashlights are limited while hunting at dark, only use white when needed, if that, green or red lenses recommended. As the dogs caught a scent, they took off through the mountain, the hunter, listening for his dogs to do what they are trained to do, tree a raccoon and bark and howl to let the hunter know they got one treat. But this night was different, he didn't hear his dogs, he instead heard this loud scream or screech, deep sound that neither resembled a human or animal. He noped out of the mountains, thinking he'll return during the light to get the dogs, being careful not to run and make too much noise, as wild animals love chasing. About an hour of hiking back to his truck, he found his dogs hiding under his truck, shivering, something that trained hunting dogs don't do, his dogs specifically, they obviously ran back to the truck, no sign of being chased back to. The hunter swears it wasn't a mountain lion or any other wild animal he knows of, as he has had run-ins with mountain lions and about every kind the Wyoming mountains has to offer. He said he has never felt so cold and scared in his life from those sounds he heard that night, has yet to hunt on that mountain since the 16 years ago. So I'm a ranger who lives and works in a remote park, in Queensland, Australia. I heard a knock on my door late at night last year. A young man from Brisbane, about a 14-hour drive away, was standing at my door. He was scared, a bit pale and a bit shaken. Transpired that he had been camping at one of my campsites, heard grunting and snarling, and they ran to the car next to his tent and drove the 30 kilometers to my house. It is a very steep, rough, clay and winding 4WD road down to my house. I don't like driving it at night at the best of time let alone when it is drizzling with rain. After he explained the noises and grunting, I told him that he had run away and risked his life because of a male kangaroo that was trying to get it on with its girl. And I said, welcome to the bush mate. I live in a house in the woods. I was sitting on my porch one night smoking. It was late as F but I was only going to be out for about 5 minutes so I didn't turn any lights on. So there I am in the pitch dark and silence and I hear coyotes go off in the distance, far off, 
probably across the road. This is fairly normal for our area. What is not normal, is that about 6 seconds after I had registered the far off noise as coyotes, another coyote went off. Probably not even 200 feet from the porch. I had never before, and have not since, felt fear physically cascade up my spine and into the lizard part of my brain, which then proceeded to broadcast run or fight better yet piss yourself over and over again. I darted into the house so quick that I forgot to chuck my cigarette into the ashtray. Second scariest thing was when I heard barred owl on my roof. I wasn't hunting but there was this time while hiking I'll never forget. Four of my friends and I are hanging out on a beautiful summer day trying to figure out plans we're all about 17. I suggest the woods near my house, there's a trail that leads to an abandoned naval airfield. I had traveled this trail several times before this and never had anything like this happen. So my friends and I are walking along this trail and we get to the hole in the fence that leads to the airfield. As we cross through the hole I get a real eerie feeling that makes me stop. Then I notice movement in the brush in front of me, a man in a full ghillie suit holding a rifle stood up from the brush. He didn't say a word as I'm shitting my pants thinking we just interrupted a military exercise by trespassing on government property. While I start blurting out I'm sorry I didn't know. Hands up in the air my other friend silently frozen behind me. This guy starts walking towards not making a sound. He raises his rifle and points it at us and starts telling us to leave and be quiet. We back off a bit and try to figure out what was going on. The guy starts to follow us still pointing his weapon so we scramble to put distance and finally we decide to leave. As we're leaving we started to realize it was an airsoft gun and the guy was pissed we gave away his location. We spent the rest of the walk acting like tug guys saying had we known we could have gotten past him. I still hike a lot but probably will never hike that trail again. I own a large, popular valley in Norway. Unfortunately, it has a dark history due to two massive tsunamis in the early 1900s that killed 135 people. I go hiking there a lot and know the valley like the palm of my hand. In the summer of 2020, I was taking a long hike by the beach and up the riverside. It was a warm and slightly windy night, and I was walking up the riverbank with one air pod in my ear when I suddenly heard a loud splash in the river. I couldn't see anything, so I assumed it was a branch or rock that had fallen. As I kept moving upwards, I got this eerie sensation of being watched. I looked around and spotted this grey thing about 40 yards away on the other side of the river. It was fairly dark at this point, so I figured it wasn't anything special until it moved. I could see it more clearly now, and it was this deer looking thing, but it wasn't a deer. I blinked, and it was gone. To this day, I have not told anyone, and I don't plan to hunt or hike that area again for a while. I don't care what people think, believe or mean, this was my experience. Not me but a friend, and he wasn't the hunter, but funniest damn story. We were backpacking in WV, and had just set up camp. My buddy wanders away from camp about one kilometer to go pop a squat and answer the call. He finds a nice cozy spot and drops tro, and starts to unload a torrent of two. After a quiet moment, he hears you about finished? My buddy spins around to find a turkey hunter about 10 feet behind him. He didn't see him there when he found the spot. He quickly pulled up his pants, didn't even wipe, muttered an apology, and booked it lol. If you're not familiar, turkey hunters are the stealthiest, head to toe camo, deep camo with no orange, usually sitting against a tree completely motionless. Not hunting. But once when I was younger my grandpa was going to take me down into the canyon to hike around. He gave me this whole speech about how we might see snakes and how I couldn't yell and scream if we saw snakes. We were standing on the lip of the canyon rim and he turned around and took one step. I watched him step over a giant snake, sunning itself on a rock. 
He turned and asked why I wasn't following him and I just pointed at it and said I don't really like snakes. He ran back up over the rim of the canyon, picked me up, and ran us back into the house. I guess it was a big coral snake. Not me but some close family friends of mine on their honeymoon decided to stay in a small one-room cabin out in the woods. To the south of this cabin was the company that rents out these cabins around 4 to 5 miles away but to the north of it there is just woods and nothing else. During their second night there they heard footsteps on one side of the cabin and they were going to check outside but then saw a figure walk past the window, obviously human. The person kept circling the cabin for around an hour occasionally fiddling with the lock on the door and then walked off to the north end of the woods. The next day they asked the people who ran the company about it and they said they didn't have any other clients at the moment and most hunters stop by and say hi before going out into the woods so they have no idea who it could have been. This was in a field not a woods. Hunting one night I noticed what I believed at first to be a star. But then it moved. Not in a straight line but in every direction and at different speeds. Imagine the star was the tip of a pencil, the sky was a page and you asked a toddler to scribble. That's how it moved. It went on for about 10 minutes, stopped moving suddenly and gained altitude rapidly until it faded out of sight. Still can't explain it to this day. Gave me a chill down my back watching it. I still lived at home when I was 19 so to get some alone time with my girl we would find a nice spot in the mountains and go at it. One night when we were out there a group of 8 TV riders came by. This happened every so often but the riders would just keep it moving and not bother us. This night after they passed us they got about 100 yards on the road and stopped. Then to my girlfriend's horror the riders, there were 5 in the group, turned around and started back toward us. She was instantly terrified. I tried to calm her down telling her it was probably friends of mine. That was very possible by the way. Just in case I grabbed my pistol from under the seat. The riders stopped right in front of us blocking my car. I realized these guys were strangers and obviously drunk. I instantly had thoughts of these guys attacking me and raping my girlfriend and that was not going to happen. I jump out the back seat naked as the day I was born with pistol in hand. I told the guys to keep it moving and we just wanted to leave. This property was owned by a coal company by the way so it couldn't have been the owners asking what I was doing. The pistol didn't scare these bozos and one even asked my girlfriend to give him a peek. I was really scared at this point then so before I even knew what I was doing the fear took control and I threw up the pistol and gave them 4 shots over their heads. This got their attention and they all double timed it back to their ATVs and hauled ass. That was exactly what my girlfriend and I did too. In the opposite direction of course. What was really scary is that people come from all over the US to ride the trails here. So these guys might have thought they could have done something then went back to wherever they came from and no one would have ever been caught. We were both really shook up. I have no idea what those guys intentions were. Were they just scaring a couple of kids or were they going to do something darker? I couldn't take the chance though. We stuck to other more secluded spots after this. I wonder what these guys thought when I jumped out the back naked as the day I was born with my heart on. I was 19 folks it took an act of God to lose an erection, whipping in the wind with a pistol in hand. I know I have never been that scared again. Hunter and outdoorsman all of my life. The one thing that makes me want to give it all up is how we hunters act towards each other online. Grown men bashing the legal harvests of another young hunter, fellow hunters arguing over successful methods and tactics, and just the overall onks towards other hunters in general. It's sickening. Our sport seems to be dying and hunters arguing with other hunters will never benefit the future of the sport. I grew up in the woods. My parents' house was in a quiet neighborhood, in a small town in Eastern Mass. 
The house was set back about 100 foot from the road. We had a fenced in backyard with a built in gate into the state forest. I grew up out there with my dad and our dog walking, hiking, fishing, building some survivalist type log cabins that my friends and I later turn into a paintball course. This was 20 plus years ago before there were a lot of deer or coyotes in the area, but we did occasionally come across some wildlife. Eventually my dad trusted me enough to let me go out alone. One day when I was 14 maybe, I was building a little hut and digging a trench for our paintball course. My dog ran to my side breathing super heavy, nervously and letting out short, chirping barks, something I've never heard her do before or any day after that. Looked up to see just a massive, hulking, all black fur creature about 100 foot up the hill from us. It was still for all of a second or two, then turned and moved into the woods away from us. To this day I won't go out in any woods alone. It was too big to be a black bear, I'm sure in my own mind I'm exaggerating what teenage me saw that day, but I'm absolutely positive it was at least 7 to 8 foot tall standing on all four legs and did not resemble a bear at all. I was snowmobiling years ago after a few days snowfall and unknowingly ran into and sunk down into a deep soft snow drift. I was deep down in it and was trying to dig myself out but ended up exhausted and drenched in sweat. I couldn't even move my legs or arms after hours of intense cardio and it was getting colder and colder as the sun was going down. I realized I was in deep shit but I physically couldn't move anymore. Couldn't believe I was about to spend a frigid night in minus 20 degree weather. I thought I was going to die. Then out of nowhere a couple of rednecks came pulling up in their own snowmobiles and dug me out and saved my ass. It was really scary by the end. The relief I felt when they pulled up and looked at me and said you got yourself into a bit of a pickle huh? Filled me with so much relief. I couldn't even be embarrassed I was so thankful to them. Never snowmobiled since, never will. I was solo hiking on a popular trail in Humboldt or Redwoods National Park. I was staying away from other people on purpose and couldn't see or hear anyone else who may have been on the same trail. Also, the trail and parking lot wasn't crowded that day and it felt like I was alone in the forest. I can't remember if I felt being watched first or heard a rustle. I saw a quick glimpse of a man. He continued to stalk or match my pace or location on the trail but he was unseen and a few feet off in the forest. I speed walked to the next couple on the trail and stayed about 10 feet behind them until we were back in the parking lot. Once I caught up to the couple, he stepped out and showed himself with sort of a smile and then went back in the forest. He was a man in his 20s 30s, he seemed well groomed, dressed in neutral hiking clothes with a backpack. The experience gave me chills. I am also aware of people disappearing in that area, but not sure if it is by choice or not or if he was practicing some weird skills. Not terrifying for me, but my partner watched me step on a snake during a desert hike and the snake quickly struck my shoe. If he didn't ask me if I was okay and tell me about it, then I would have never known it happened. Sure enough, there were two puncture holes in my gym shoes, I wasn't even wearing hiking boots. Northern Ontario, Canada, it was a nice sunny July afternoon. Girlfriend and I pull into a friend's cabin way off grid. No one's there yet, so we started to unpack the pickup truck. Suddenly, we hear horrifying screaming, which turns into what I can only describe as gorilla ooh ooh ah ah kind of in and out sound. It lasted so long, and I could feel the bass in my chest. I didn't see anything yet, but whatever made that noise was close. When I was a kid, probably 7 or 8, I was out dirt biking in the woods with my dad. These were trails through a nature preserve that were approved for dirt biking and such but the forests are protected. Well, we come across these two sketchy looking characters logging in the woods super illegally. 
They are in the trail and we stop and they start talking to us, telling us about how it's their uncle's land and they just got out of jail and were logging it. We knew it was illegal but didn't really want to bring up what the obviously new hole out in the middle of the woods. After a few minutes, one of the guys stops, looks at us and goes man, it's kinda like deliverance out here isn't it? My dad gave me the look and we immediately ripped out of there. Watching horror films as a kid pays off. Bear hunting in Sweden. We hunt with a barking dog that usually makes the bear stay still so that the shot is easier. A good bear hunt is usually a quite mundane activity with a bear walking past a hidden hunter and dying within seconds of the shot. This time however I saw the dog moving in a strange star shaped pattern. It was basically retreating from a point, 100 meters or so, and then back again. I heard it barking and when the dog named Ulf, an old jammed hunt with a long life of hunting experience, was running at 30 kilometers an hour something was obviously off. I start walking towards him to try to call him in and stop whatever madness was going on, when I experienced it. I see the thin but very tall birch trees in front of me moving like a scene from Jurassic Park. And I hear the sound of paws like drumming on the ground when it was running together with its breathing like Vogue, 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 Vogue. I took a stand behind a fallen tree and thought what the F am I doing with my life? Then comes Ulf, the dog, running for his life with a crazy here we go. Look. And behind Ulf comes the bear in full speed. Was it big etc? Yeah enough to take me at least. The bear stops when it sees me and we get eye contact at about 10 meters between us with me directing my hun towards its head, I wanted it to die on the spot in case I would shoot. Then when both Ulf and the bear are standing still I hear a twig breaking somewhere else behind the bear. Two cubs come out of the shrubbery behind it. They are so cute and just look like they are having the blast of their lives. I kept aiming at the mama bear thinking don't make me do this. Until it left with its cubs. We cancelled the bear hunt in that area and it was the last time I hunted bear. I could have easily shot the mama bear by accident before seeing the cubs, thinking it was alone. I decided that I don't want to hunt with that possibility, so that was enough bear hunting for me. I still meet them from time to time, but under better circumstances. One time I was solo camping on Crown Land in Ontario. This is out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody around for miles type nowhere. So night time rolls around and I'm in my tent just laying there enjoying the quiet. All of a sudden I heard loud footsteps coming around my sight, near where I had my fire pit dug. I figured it was a bear or moose because they're definitely around the area. Suddenly I get a whiff of cigarette smoke unmistakable smell of cigarette smoke in the nice clean woods nighttime air. I hop out of the tent with my shotgun in hand and there's some guy snooping around my belongings. He doesn't seem surprised or scared. He says oh and just walks away. I don't know who he was, what he wanted, or where he came from. Like this area is middle of Alaska type wilderness. I didn't sleep that night and I packed up out headed out break of dawn. In March 2021, I woke up in the middle of the night and went downstairs to check on my pet Irish setter. It was dark in the living room when I got there. Every light in the house was off except for the electric night lights all around the perimeter of the downstairs and upstairs. So, you can easily see things while walking around in the dark. My house is kind of small and next to a few large local trailer parks. To my surprise, when I got downstairs my dog was awake in its crate and looking up at a huge 9 foot tall hunched over dog man. The terrifying thing was towering up to the ceiling and was so tall that it was hunched over just to fit in the living room by our pet's crate. I am 6 foot 2 inches tall and skinny but even I had to tilt my neck upward just to look up at it. My dog was awake staring straight up at it. I never keep my dog in the crate but sometimes my family snatches him from me and puts him in there. Anyway, this nasty looking cryptid had strange feet and stood only on its tiptoes. 
It was not flat-footed like people are. It was impossible for a person to stand this way which made me shudder. The thing had very little fur on its body, but really only had a giant mane of hair from its head, neck, and upper back downward. The hair was super long too, but the rest of its body lacked hair this is why I mentioned mole rats in my previous post even though these creatures are obviously not related. Its arms were outstretched to its sides extremely far as well because it obviously had no idea what it was like to be in my house before. It must have had to feel the walls of the small house with its arms just to move around. The arms were too long and far stretched out to even be a person in an outfit. It was obviously downstairs for a while making noise trying to eat my pet. This explains why I woke up out of nowhere like that. What was scariest was that the dog man was standing there practically frozen in time looking at me with ears pointing straight up. It was processing my location and was slowly moving toward me. At first, when I saw it, it was stunned and did not want to move, but when I got closer to it, it started slowly moving toward me and I panicked hardcore as anyone would. Its face was the nastiest, most gnarly thing ever. Huge elongated snout when it turned its head suddenly. It looked like something with nasty rabies or mange and that tells me it was underground for a while struggling or starving. Its teeth were grossly sharp. I ran as fast as possible bumping into walls over and over with it breathing loudly while I was yelling at the top of my lungs in terror. I was falling in my socks too while trying to climb the stairs to wake up my relatives. My dog was just listening to everything at that point and he hardly made noise because he was obviously shaken too. When I got to my mom she woke up screaming too and called the police while hiding in her room. I booked it back downstairs with some blades to find the living room empty. Then I realized it could have been in any room in my small home, such as the kitchen, bathroom, or basement, so I booked it out the front door in the night, knowing that my mom was safe with her husband barricaded in her room with them both yelling. I informed them in time that something was downstairs. I figured with quick thinking that all of us yelling probably could scare the thing away, as you would do when encountering a bear or wolf in the woods. I booked it out of the front door and walked about 10 miles in the night with bare necessities I could grab in time. I was terrified and only had blades, I am a 26 year old felon and I am not allowed to own or carry firearms. I walked away like this because I did not want to find the thing unexpectedly in my house in some random room that I did not check, such as the basement or bathroom. I was just happy to be gone and alive while the cops checked everywhere for the giant intruder. I've been in cuffs a bunch of times too and do not trust cops anyway unless they are just with my mom and her husband. I got lucky. After all, I was more familiar with my house than the dogman was. Anyway, the best part for last, when I got back home, a large glass window which was approximately 5 feet tall and 4 feet wide was completely shattered the thing obviously had a direct line of sight from our large backyard into my kitchen and living room, directly where the dog slept, and my family thought it was me that broke the window. Turns out that the dogman tore through our house from this one glass window. I had to yell at my family for about a year until my mom and brother admitted they were wrong and that the thing obviously existed. Finally, my dog does not run into the night anymore when I open the door of the house. One of the accounts that I recently heard, while listening to YouTube, nearly caused me to crash my car. It was a story about the sighting of a large humanoid creature, wearing what appeared to be a black cloak, with an owl's face, in the central Florida area. Talk about a heart-stopping moment. Here is my encounter with a similar entity. It was an afternoon in late May this year, 2021. I remember it was later in the afternoon, early evening, but it was a slightly overcast and gray day, so I can't tell you from memory if it was dusk or earlier. I live near a nature conservation area in the central Florida area. My husband and I were very fortunate to find our property, ample acreage, heavily wooded to the point where we could not see our neighbors or any lights from their homes. We lovingly call our home the swamp. I was outside in our driveway, which is the only cleared space on our land, save for a natural circular clearing in our woods. 
I was walking back to our porch when for some reason, I was compelled to turn and look back to the tree line, around 80 to 100 feet away from the house. I do want to note that there was not a single ounce of fear in me, in fact, I was quite calm when I made eye contact with it. At first, I didn't register what I was looking at. I knew it was an owl, which for my woods is not an uncommon sighting. But then it kind of shifted and I saw more of it. It was not just an owl, it was the head of an owl on what I can only describe as the shoulders of a human, and it looked like it was wearing a dark cloak, either made of dark foliage or feathers. It was tall, and from the trees around it, I guessed around 7 feet or so. It just looked at me, and I looked at it. I looked around and blinked, sincerely thinking it was a trick of the lighting, or my mind creating a thing where there was nothing, but no, when I looked back it was still there, calm and unmoving. I was still unafraid, which is not normal for me as I can freak myself out easily. For some reason, I felt another urge, this time to nod. I nodded towards it like I was showing my acknowledgement of it, it felt natural and right to do so, then turned and went inside my home. I did not go back outside that day, but the next morning I went back outside and stood in the same place on my porch to look at what it may have been and there was nothing I could even remotely try to place as it. The space where it stood was between two trees at the opening to the forest line leading back to the small clearing, there were no low hanging branches, no large leaves, no anything that I could trick myself into believing that was what I had actually seen. I have not seen it since then. I did some mild searching on the internet but found nothing even remotely close to it so I just let it go. Until today, when I heard that story about an hour ago now. Does anyone know what this might be? Has anyone else in the central FL area, or anywhere, seen anything like this? My boyfriend experienced something very unusual and I'm reaching out to see if you have heard about anyone else who has ever experienced anything similar. This occurred in northwestern North Carolina in 2022. He and his partner at the time were sleeping in bed. They were in a bedroom that had French doors that opened to the backyard. The house is on a large piece of property with a stream that comes straight out of the mountain from an aquifer. He awoke randomly and saw two red eyes pass by the window of the French doors about 7 to 8 feet off of the ground. The door opened, as a very intense vibration started and he sat up to scream and could not hear himself yelling. He could see his cat at the edge of the bed hissing. His partner didn't stir. The vibration caused him to fall back and he passed out. He woke up face down on the bed with his head turned towards the edge of the mattress. He was unable to move. A figure rose and was completely out of focus a few inches from his face. He states its motion was so unnaturally fluid. He could see his surroundings but could not focus on the creature. He explains it as if the creature was out of focus in a photograph. He then unfocused his eyes, used his peripheral vision, and was able to see the creature clearly. He states it had brown-green coloring with scales and a worn face bright red eyes that glowed. When he saw the creature and was able to really decipher what he was looking at. It opened a very large mouth and gave him a gigantic toothy smile. He says he felt its energy, that it was amused at him for figuring out how to see it. The vibration began again as he watched the creature sink back out of view below the edge of the mattress before passing out again. He awoke several hours later and his partner had no idea anything had occurred. He said the entire time he felt no emotion. No fear, no anger, nothing. He says he knows something violent happened to him and he thinks they wanted to take him but didn't. He had rows of red dots across his back and stated it looked like he laid on a bed of nails. He assumes this type of humanoid creature came from underground and travels or lives through the cave systems here. We know there's got to be some sort of opening in the land where the aquifer exits and the water flows down the property. This is his father's property, about 10 acres. We now live across the street and I lock my doors out of paranoia now. The correlation between missing persons around cave systems is unsettling and I wonder if this has anything to do with it. Are any similar experiences?
In Boonville, Indiana, on February 20, 2024, a woman was found in a drainage culvert along Highway 62, with multiple severe injuries. She was found 350 yards away from the Sheriff's Department complex and county garage. From what we have gathered in our neighborhood, I live a half mile from all of these locations. Apparently she was attacked by a large unknown and unidentified canine. The local news media hasn't received any further updates since around 10 a.m. This is a very small and tight-knit community. Why haven't the local news stations been updated within 9 to 10 hours? My son Jake first showed his awareness of the natural world when he was only two he pointed at a something I couldn't see in a tree and said cheep cheep before three birds took flight. Our adopted dog Toby had runaway fever, but Jake was always able to find him in an afternoon of driving around. The fatherly sense within told me that Jake was tapping into something greater than intuition, and I wanted to test it. Jake's first hunting lesson was killing the barn rats out back. Jake didn't take to his 22 and despised the act of killing, even for fair vermin like the five-pound rats that ate our stores. But he did it, and he was good at it. Really good. I couldn't understand it. Jake was tagging leaping, zigzagging rats with single shots while I was lucky just to graze one if I were able to do that at his age of 10, I would have thought I were one of the world's most deadly men, but apparently my son had more constraint and tact than I did. He bagged 32 rats in two and a half hours. I had four. Jake confirmed that only three male rats remained, and that they would scatter to find mates. Jake was right. Jake acted as my guide when we hunted and fished together. My son led me right to the biggest buck or fish without hesitation or delay, every time. I didn't consider having Jake as a hunting guide as cheating I considered it how God intended for us to have our little edge out here on this hard world at winning father, son hunting competitions. The hunting purses went to entry fees to bigger events, and more time with my son. Truth be told, his mother hated the weeks of away in the wilderness until I set down our biggest purse to date for dragging in a 603 pound black marlin. I had to set the entire cash prize down in front of her, just so that she could see what $1.3 million really looks like before it went to the bank a towering 7 foot monolith made of $100 bills on a wood pallet. Jake had located the black striped marlin won it for us on his 16th birthday. After the winnings, my wife now saw Jake's talent for what it was a gift honed by years of field training, a gift that reached beyond the sporting world like the girl. We were all driving back from the grocery store when Jake made us stop the car he knew there's someone not far from the highway who needed our help. We stopped and followed Jake to what looked like an old dry well, where we found a girl had fallen through the rotted board sealing the opening. Jake got his photo taken with the first responders, it made the cover of two local newspapers under the headline Boy Finds, Saves Local Girl from Derelict Water Tank. But my wife still disliked all the time away from home, that couldn't be changed. But our address could. So we took the rest of the big prize and purchased a house out of state, somewhere wooded, closer to nation's largest competitions. 127 McKean Street's 144 photos and videos all showed a very nice, modern two-story home for a 50 grand under similar places, divorce distress sale. The chief of police of the town owned it and vouched for its condition personally. Based on photos alone, and we packed up our things and drove for two solid days, 1,600 miles home. 144 pictures and 19 phone conversations aside, to buy a property sight unseen seemed dumber to my wife and I the longer we drove. Our anxiety stayed with us until we saw the home's welcoming neighborhood, immaculate exterior and fresh, open partially furnished rooms inside. My wife loved the gardens and the views, I loved the garage and the fact that all the foundation and guts of the house were new. My son reserved immediate judgment. He was even a little hesitant walking into the house. As we unpacked, my son kept nervously looking around as if he were waiting for something to come out and bite him. His paranoia came to a peak when he hung off the second-story guardrail to rip out a light bulb at the center of the wall below. 
Jake took the bulb outside and smashed it in the street. I went to go have a talk with him I told him I trusted him, even with my life and I never once questioned him, but now I needed to know why he smashed that bulb. Jake looked back at the house for a very long time and said, Dad, I don't track those animals by the little hints in the ground or by what the waters are doing. It's a sense, from an organ that's probably in my brain, like your nose. But only I have this kind of nose, the kind that sniffs out where animals even people are. And I can't describe smell to someone who never had a nose. But I can smell in a different way, even in the dark, even if you cast my head in plaster. And that light bulb was alive, dad. I sensed it like a living bird, a dog you or me, like that girl down in the water tank. That bulb was at least piece of something living. Like an eye. I asked my son if the light bulb still was living. He looked down at the bulb shards in the street and muttered no. Not like before. But. He didn't finish the sentence as he stared up at our new, pastel-colored cooker-cutter townhouse. He seemed to be consumed with grim concern. At the time, my wife and I were exhausted from driving 800 miles while being on our last few hundred dollars, and the idea of blowing that at a dirty motel for an indefinite period of time was not an option I was willing to take. I will admit that I dismissed my son's concerns into puberty-induced paranoia. I also dismissed the realization of how silly that reasoning was. This house was nice. It was cheap, next to some big prize tournaments plain and simple. I'll live with sentient light bulbs. What are they going to do? Turn off and on? Turn my house into a rave? We appreciated the fact the house came with nice dressers, bureaus and beds with factory plastic still on them, a fantastic site for burnout travelers with a leaking air mattress. We had just enough energy to unpack the sheets to make the bed, crashing immediately. I don't remember how long I slept, but I woke in the dark not being able to move. Like the bed was holding me like it was the world's most powerful magnet and I was made of pure iron. I saw wife struggle meekly under the blankets she made little sounds as if she were in pain the worst part was, I couldn't even lift an arm to knock off the blanket to see what was wrong. I would have been dead if it weren't for Jake pulling ripping me off of the bed. I fell limp in my son's arms I didn't lack the energy, I wasn't winded, I simply didn't have the bodily strength to stand. Worse yet, when I fell, my bare feet and hands that touched the hardwood floor, and I could feel that magnetic suction again. My son, 165 pounds, carried me, formerly 230 pounds, down the stairs and out of the house as if I were his petite bride and set me on the front lawn. My bed was alive too, dad, Jake said as he helped me stand on wobbly legs. I never got in it. I went to your guy's room to wake you up but you were already in. I collapsed again. I told Jake to dial 911. I was surprised to see the police chief that owned the home before us show up with the fire department. They went up to the bedroom and found my wife's underwear in our bed but no woman. The chief had a steadfast belief that my wife was simply confused and lost and that she'll turn up any time now, and laughed when I told what happened, with being stuck to the bed. He even laughed when I told him that I was 230 pounds and 6 foot 5 a few hours ago now, I was about the same height and weighed less as my son. He asked what, do you want me to believe this house was somehow eating you? That it ate your wife? Are you insane? That's exactly what I wanted him to believe, and if I were not as big as I were, it would have totally absorbed me like it did to my wife. Until they found her. The chief came back with my wife wrapped in one of those heavy white trauma blankets. Both of them were beaming unflinching smiles. My wife said silly me, I got turned around in a closet and didn't know where I was. Much better now. And the chief nodded with satisfaction. I never heard my wife talk like that, and the woman I know would never be turned around in a closet. Jake then pulled me away from the crowd and whispered I don't know what the chief or that lady claiming to be mom are, but they are not alive. I went on a 20 miler on August 28, 2022 on a trail near Batstow village. 
We misjudged how long we'd be out there for and it started to get dark and we began to run out of water. Our headlamps also began to die. But the worst part was when we began to hear whispering voices and figures out of the corners of our eyes, we got separated from the other people we were hiking with and when we regrouped they said they experienced the same thing. We would also see the same marked tree over and over again like we were going in a circle. We didn't get out of the trail until 10 p.m. in the pitch dark. Friend and I took six kids hiking on AP a day, hers, mine, two she was babysitting, and a friend of my oldest. We get to this little bridge just to the side of the path used for days when that spot gets super mucky, and the kids were running back and forth across it pretending to be billy goats yelling wake up troll. Not long after, some bent little old man with a bulbous nose and his toke on badly so it looked pointy comes down the trail. Friend and I quietly joke so the kids can't hear that maybe they did wake a troll. As we're trying to pass him he grabs my four-year-old and demands kisses from her and will not let go. Friend rips my kid out of his reach, passes her to me, and I shove six screaming kids down the path as fast and far as we could book it. Report him to the cops, they meet us in the woods. Later find me and tell me they found the guy, he was just an old man from the old country and doesn't understand social boundaries, they let him off with a warning. My oldest says he's still in the woods when theater class goes for walks sometimes. They stay as far from him as they can manage. It's been 11 years, we haven't seen him in a while. But this dude singled put the smallest, most vulnerable child in the group and tried to force kisses on it. I don't hike without the ability to defend myself anymore. I was near Lake Huron in Ontario and I was driving south in a taxi. I was working as a taxi driver at the time and I passed an area and on the way back, only about 10 minutes later, I came upon the most bizarre scene. There was a deer cut in half in the road and it was not hit by a truck. This deer looked like it had been through quite a struggle and there were large footprints all around it. Standing over top of it was about an eight and a half foot Bigfoot. It looked like yellow flashlights were glowing out of his eyes. I took my car and I passed the Bigfoot. I put it in reverse. I hit the gas. I drove through the Bigfoot. His arm went through the windows of my car and through my head and it was like he was a hologram and he moved very quickly when he did this. After that, it went over to the side of the road and it looked like it was climbing down into the ditch and down into the ground like there was a hole there. It was the most bizarre thing that ever happened. To see a deer cut in half like that with something that a car couldn't do. I was like, well if this isn't a physical creature, how did he rip this deer in half? There were bloody footprints all around the deer. I tried to hit it because I thought if I could at least do some damage to the Bigfoot we would have won finally. A quick background, I've been a fan of high strangeness, the paranormal, and unexplained phenomena since I was about 12 and found an old Reader's Digest style our mysterious world book amongst my dad's stuff. I'm now in my late 30s and I've experienced enough weird and uncanny events that I'm a firm believer, including intuition that saved my life more than once. But I have to stress I'm a pretty sensible person for the most part and nobody of particular note. I have a family, kids, and a happy married life. I know elements of what I'm about to relay are going to be fairly insane. So take everything with a grain of salt and an open mind. I'll be interested to know if you've ever heard anything like this before and the only reason I am even willing to share this is because you seem to be the guy for this sort of thing. In early 2012 I was going through a very difficult time in my life and for amusement, my wife and I visited a local psychic in Grand Prairie, Alberta. My wife's reading was filled with errors and information we knew to be wrong, but we played along for a laugh. When it came to my turn, this obvious charlatan precisely described my deceased German grandfather with details of his appearance that nobody could know and personal details about the last time I saw him alive that left me speechless. 
She also advised us that the spirits wanted us to know the deep freeze we had been given for free from our surly next door neighbor we didn't really know had once held a dead body and we needed to get rid of it because it had dark energy attached to it. This freaked us out because this stupid freezer had a makeshift gas block on it and we didn't think anything of it. To shorten this part of the story, I began texting the psychic directly, and out of nowhere, she told me I should look into reptilian aliens. Now, I should note that while I loved weird and unexplained stories, I was absolutely freaked out when I was younger by stories of evil reptilians and blood-drinking shapeshifting lizard people from many late-night internet dives, and I specifically stayed away from those tales out of genuine discomfort and fear. I could handle ghosts, alien abductions, cattle mutilations, the occult, etc., but I was terrified that reptilians might actually exist out there in some dark corner of reality. In retrospect, that fact is deeply amusing, but it was a weird thing for this maybe psychic to zero in on. And I started reading about lizard people online, running into the Lacerta files, the whole shape-shifting madness, etc. I didn't see the point of following that trail, because I was straight up having nightmares about it and felt like a little kid, and we stopped talking to the psychic lady shortly after that because the whole experience genuinely weirded us out. So you can imagine the terror I experienced one afternoon when I was working in the basement pit of a drive through oil change outfit and saw a huge muscular mustard yellow scaly lizard man with a stubby face, a heavy brow, and horrible piercing yellow eyes. I'll never forget literally walking through the brick wall at the far end of the basement, staring at me with a clear air of disdain, and then vanishing in a blink. I have to stress I'm talking about a full flesh and blood figure that occupied physical space and cast a shadow on the ground. I could tell he was male, he had pants and a vest on, and he carried an unpleasant odor. Then blink, gone. All of it. The experience shook me so bad that I swore off paranormal stuff and I never told another living soul about what I had seen fearing I was losing my mind. That's just the start of the story. I haven't gotten to the weird part yet. Flash forward a year. We moved to central Alberta, my life improved, and I had largely forgotten the reptilian thing, having chalked it up to the stress I was under, my mind playing tricks on me, etc. I think I suppressed it mentally because it caused me real distress and trauma. Then randomly I began hearing a voice in my head when I was alone. It was separate from my own internal monologue and thoughts. It felt like a presence in my head and it gave me headaches at first. I really thought I was insane now, especially when this voice started to form intelligible words in a female voice, offering commentary, warnings, and simple yes and no answers. It was the freakiest thing at first, and I genuinely considered mental health but I kept it to myself. I mean, do you admit you're hearing a voice in your head? I hoped it would go away. But it didn't. And the sense of presence grew stronger over time. It also got easier for this other to talk to me, as if it was becoming easier to get through. And then, at once, a floodgate opened, and this voice could now talk to me. The headache stopped. It just kind of became a thing I lived with. Then things escalated to regular conversation contained in my head, and this other identified herself as a humanoid reptilian female originally from the Capella star system, although she was quite clear that she wasn't a physical entity in our earthly sense and existed beyond perception in another level of reality. So, at this point, I'm sure I'm insane. This is two months of this and I have this voice in my head talking to me. There were truly freaky qualities to it. She has an accent, she explained she's not actually speaking English but my brain is decoding her speech and relaying it in a form of mental telepathy that is actually pretty common where she is. I could tune her out if I wanted to, but when she was nearby she offered helpful advice, mild precognition, and cautions of what I should and shouldn't do, such as having me avoid a particular stretch of road only to find out there was an accident later on, only wanted positive thoughts things for me and began to explain she was in fact my assigned spirit guide, or guardian angel, or whatever you want to call it. There's so much to explain with that, but this is already getting too long. One night, 
Overwhelmed by the whole thing, I finally broke down to my wife and explained I had a voice in my head, and to my utter incredulity, my wife didn't offer to lock me up after asking many questions but said she had the same kind of guy Del did, but she couldn't talk to hers like I could and gets feelings instead and she, in turn, didn't want me to think she was nuts. So, yeah. This hasn't changed. In fact, I've formed a close and beneficial relationship with this being over the last decade. She's told me things I couldn't possibly have known on my own, slyly told me about future events years before they happened, and she's been nothing but a positive influence on my life. And specifically, she's here for my benefit. So much has happened that would take another thousand words to tell, but I am utterly convinced I am in regular contact with my own personal interdimensional lizard woman from across space and time. It's very very important that I stress that this is a day-to-day interaction. Sometimes I receive her loud and clear, sometimes she is kind of a delay, but I don't do any special meditation or ritual to reach her. She's just there if I need her. Likewise, she pops in when she wants. Now, there's an element to this story that takes it beyond madness. About three years ago my young daughter started seeing the rainbow lizard as in she started seeing my frigging lizard woman in both dreams and as an ethereal being. She described her physical appearance perfectly, her coloring, and passed on things that she was told to tell me that, uh, pretty much confirmed this is a real thing and it's not just me. The rainbow reference comes from the fact my daughter always sees her with shimmering fluctuating colors like LSD or DMT style tripping. I'm told this is a side effect of us not having the same perception of color that lizard has on her side. To this day she'll still claim to have seen a rainbow lizard at night. My wife has also intimately experienced the phenomena, electronics being messed with, messages from her guide that were repeatedly independent of mine and so on. It's all very matter of fact for us. And in closing, I'm also completely straight laced and have never done any drugs in my life and I've never been drunk. Just thought I should say that. For the last few days I've been home alone. Completely alone in an empty apartment. A few weeks ago, my boyfriend got a great job offer out of state. We've been wanting to move out of Florida for a quite a long time so when he got the offer, we didn't hesitate to pack up and head out of town. Even with a full month of rent paid at our current apartment. With the quick move, I didn't have a chance to say goodbye to several good friends and figured since the rent was paid, I'd come back myself and spend a couple of weeks. My job allows me to work remote or from their Florida office so even though my apartment is empty, no cable or internet. I still had a place to work. When I said the apartment was empty, it wasn't completely true. I had a large piece of furniture I decided to sell rather than move and posted it on Craigslist. This is where I think I made a big mistake. I posted my address. Granted, my address wasn't up long, the furniture sold that same day. But since I posted the ad yesterday, weird things have been happening. The first thing that happened didn't seem that strange at first. Thing is I have a cat so I'm used to noises coming from all over and almost every time it's the cat being, well, a cat. He's the type that likes to knock things on the ground for fun. Oh, you were drinking that? Yep, no remorse. So when I was laying on my air mattress reading God and heard a bunch of commotion from the kitchen I just thought, oh there he goes again and went back to reading. Until I remembered the cat isn't even here. We took him to our new place. So I awkwardly rolled off the air mattress, why is it so difficult to get up off these things? And went to the kitchen to investigate. A few red solo cups that had previously been on the kitchen counter were on the ground. I looked around and the only thing I could figure is that the fan was on and it had blown them off. At least that's what I told myself in order to get to sleep. The truth is those cups had been sitting on the counter the whole day. And the fan was on. Why did they just fall to the ground now? I put it out of my head and turned the lights out and read my Kindle a bit more before falling asleep. I woke up at 3am to a rattling or jingling sound. Like someone was shaking a jar of pennies or maybe a set of janitor's keys. 
I'd never heard a sound like this before, nothing even slightly close. It seemed like it was coming more from outside the apartment but it was still really loud. As soon as I got out of bed, the noise stopped. I turned on every light in the house but couldn't find the source. So I went back to bed with all the lights on. It was comforting having all the lights on and I slipped into a deep sleep almost immediately. When I woke up this morning, I didn't realize until I flipped on the light switch in the bathroom that every light in the house was off. No one has ever told me I sleepwalk but I couldn't think of any other reason the lights were turned off. The front door is locked by a deadbolt and a regular door lock. I shook it off and got ready for work. When I had showered and gotten dressed, I grabbed my purse to leave but I couldn't find my keys. Because I hate searching for my keys in the mess I call a purse, I keep them on a carabiner and clip them to my bag. It's such a habit, I clip them to my bag without even thinking about it. When I didn't find them on my purse I figured there's always a chance, I don't know that I put them in the freezer with the groceries I brought home or put them on the kitchen counter by mistake. But I looked everywhere and nothing. They weren't in the freezer, fridge, microwave, counters, bathroom or anywhere else. Then I remembered the jingling sound I heard in the middle of the night. I went to look, even though it was nearly impossible for them to be outside, the only way is if they had fallen out of my bag on my way in the house and I needed them to get into the house so would have missed them last night, not now. I went outside and there were my keys, lying on welcome mat outside my front door. Covered in something red. Like blood, or something that looks awfully similar. That's when I knew I might have made a big mistake posting my address on Craigslist. I'll see what happens tonight and post an update if anyone's interested. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.